in three, two, one, you're locked. Hello, 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 Santa Barbara. It's your Chantress of everything valuable and beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart. Today, we have the most beautiful topic in the world on our show about the arts and preparedness, and that is our family treasures. And what do I mean by our family treasures? I mean our dogs and cats and the pets in our house. I think you're prejudiced. <laughs> yeah, I am a little bit, Scott. I have Scott Haskins with me, and Scott's a, a friend of mine and an esteemed colleague conservator and restorer and um, he's an expert nationally considered on uh, emergency preparedness. He's been writing books on emergency preparedness since I met him, you know, years ago. So it's been over, I don't know, a decade or a decade and a half of writing mm -hmm. uh, about emergency preparedness for the government, for private organizations, for private people. I have his books and his latest book is about how to handle your pets in an emergency and why pets matter and um he does a little introduction which i think is fantastic so his general message is been for a decade as i say how to save your stuff and so he decided to write another book and this particular book is in co-authorship with diane stevenette okay protect your pet guidebook and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about inspiration for the book and just a little introduction for Scott. Uh, he was trained in Italy as a, a conservator and he has worked nationwide. Um, when I try to catch him, usually he's, you know, in LA, he's in New York, et cetera, but um, he lives here in Santa Barbara. Um, his lab here in Santa Barbara is the Fine Art Conservation Lab. And if you don't know about it, or if you've got a, a, a piece of art that's damaged or needs cleaning, et cetera, Scott is your guy. Um, his multimedia book, which you can take a look at online, is SaveYourStuff.com. You can find it on SaveYourStuff.com. Right now, he's working on a couple big projects. Um, he's often worked for major churches when he's done, you know, extensive mural restoration, etc. cetera. Um, but the important thing about this particular Save Your Stuff series that actually has been going on since 1994, um, Scott's entry into the world of conservatorship was early on in the 70s. And he sort of hung his head as an expert um, in this particular market in 1975. So he's been doing this a long, long time. Um, the interesting thing, says Meryl Streep, about being a mother is that everyone wants pets, but no one wants to clean the kitty litter. <laughs> and another quote, can you relate? Uh, Mr. Winston Churchill said this, I'm fond of pigs, dogs look up to us, cats look down on us, and pigs treat us as equals. <laughs> My dad used to say, uh, uh, to each his own, said the farmer as he kissed the cow. <laughs> yes. So the value of our animals and what they, our animals do for us in a crisis. And the first book, which is um, a, a go-to for me, How to Save Your Stuff from a Disaster. We're going to talk a little bit with Scott Haskins about what his inspiration to write this book was outside of the fact of his beautiful, beautiful little animals uh, there's Richard, she's showing us, uh, by the way, you can't see it, of course, because you're listening on the radio, but the cover of Scott's book and a beautiful woman holding three gorgeous animals on the front of the cover, How to Save Your Pet from a Disaster. So, you know, fire season's coming up as well. Yeah. Um, it's just an interesting thing when I think about a quote that Scott sent me last night. So you think you're taking care of your pet. Your pet is probably taking care of you. All right, Scott. So um, I wonder if you'd reflect on that. So what evidence do you have that our pets are concerned about us in this COVID As I pandemic? talked to people, it became immediately um, evident that these pets provide, I mean, even if, even if they're not trained to be formal therapy dogs or cats or animals, they provide an amazing amount of, of, of therapy to people. And it's, a, and I asked you, I asked you about it. I talked to uh, you about your dog, about Bear. 
And you were very complimentary, very enthusiastic about all the comfort that you receive, the evening out of your moods, the, the bounce in your sense of humor, and uh, the leveling out of your emotions, all happening because uh, you've got this little guy that, that looks you straight in the eye and you melt. Am, am I right? You're right. You know, it's an interesting thing. So I have a vet here in town, Peggy Larned, and Peggy runs Artemis Animal Clinic. And Peggy is a holistic veterinarian. And so she does, um, she does energy readings on the dog and she, she's done energy readings on bear. She just fairly recently because his liver was acting up. And so um, we, you know, met her in the parking lot with our masks on and she kind of, you know, kind of did her thing with, with Bear. And she said, you know, he's holding a lot of um, anxiety for you, Elizabeth. He's holding a lot of anxiety and he's, and it's, it's something that is um, anchored in his past and your past both. And he's mm -hmm. holding these emotions for you and somehow that's affecting his general well-being. You know, dogs are little energetic creatures and they have this, um, they pick up on energy. You know, they know when you're not well, they know when you're in, in, a, in a funk, they, they know when you're distressed and they, they respond to you. And so something in, in the, the dog's past and something in my past mesh mm -hmm. because of the anxiety level of this crisis and so she gave me some um, ways to actually kind of massage his spine and get that out of his mm. nervous system, central nervous system. At first I was like, oh, can, this can't work. You know, his liver readings won't go down because of um, me stroking, you know, his spine in a certain way, but lo and behold, they have. Yeah, that's not true. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we don't understand uh, the uh, energy levels or the capabilities or, of, of pets, but let me tell you something a little odd. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother, uh, my grandmother, uh, for no effort on her own, my grandmother would walk outside her door and dogs and cats would come from all over the place. <laughs> and she was like, she was like Pied Piper of the neighborhood animal kingdom. And I, and I've inherited part of this unseen vibe that, uh, and, and, and I can't tell you how often I go to people's homes to uh, consult for artwork and I meet with people all the time uh, and, and, and talk to people about their artwork. They call in and say, hey, I've got this, or I've got that. And so I'm all, I, I just got back from Salt Lake City meeting with clients in Las Vegas. I'm on my way. As soon as I finish this interview, I've got to meet with clients in, uh, in South Orange County. And I, I come to the house and I can't tell you, maybe eight out of 10 times I walk in the house and the cat or the dog comes up and says hi. And the person is looking at me with this blank look that says, what the heck? I was just, a, I was in Park City and I walked in, I walked in the house and the lady looks at me, she says, wow, what, who, who are you? And I, well, I'm an art conservator, Scott. And no, it says, my cats run for the hills every time somebody walks in the house. And I had one rubbing on my leg and the other one sitting on the, low, on the chair looking at me. She says, they never act like this with anybody. And I get that all the time with cats and dogs. And um, so the idea of animals reading us is, uh, is something that I've, I've seen in my life, not because I've read a book or, or, you know, or studied voodoo or something. It's just something that I see around me all the time. Yeah. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Sturm speaking with my dear friend, Scott Haskins, who's written a new book that's fourth in the series, How to Save Your Pet from a Disaster. And before we get too far, Scott, how can folks find the book? Uh, they can't <laughs> because okay. they published it. You are you are on the cutting edge. We are. Uh, I mentioned to you that that I had a a, a, a New York Times top ten best selling author to do the forward, and he was so enthusiastic about this book. His name is Raymond Aaron. He's written two Chicken Soup for the Soul books. He was so excited about it. He proposed our our manuscript to an organization that is awarding us an international book award that we 
aren't going to get till September uh, at a big event in Toronto, Canada. So uh, I've just finished uh, the second version of editing. Uh, you know, the cover's done. Everything's done. We're going through formatting right now. And I'm hoping to have in hand a copy of the book in about a month. Well, okay, Scott, now I want to talk to Scott about prescriptions for disaster preparedness for the pet. So what would you say, Scott, would be the very top of your list? Well, uh, I'm guessing that in an emergency situation, I mean, of course, you might have, uh, you know, a broken water heater at the house. That's a disaster for the house. It can cause a lot of damage. But um, let's say in our area, we live in earthquake zone. Uh, we live in wildfire zone. Obviously, we've also uh, found out that we live in mudslide zone. And so you've, uh, there's a chance that you might have to take off. And we often, uh, we, of, we often travel with our pets and, you know, in our cars. And so the whole idea of having uh, everything safe in the vehicle, in other words, how to travel with your pet is a big deal. You don't just like let the dog get in the back of the, you know, in the back seat and then drive on down the road. Is when you get outside the house and everybody's nervous and everybody's stressing and it's not a normal situation, the animal gets freaked out also. And so what happens if, if, they, if they're not on a lead? I mean, normally they would walk with you, but what about if they bolt? And so uh, are they microchipped? Uh, do, they have a, do, they, do they have their collar and their license on them? Uh, you know, are they going to get into something like uh, something they're going to eat that's not good for them? They're so nervous. Uh, are they going to get dehydrated because they're not, they're so nervous and, and crazy, they're not drinking, or they're drinking impure water that's bad. I mean, there's just so many booby traps for these uh, beloved members of the, ho of the family that unless we think ahead a little bit and take the precautions, you know, have a, have a grab and go kit for them, things that will calm them, because if they're calm, they're going to take care of you. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing is that you're not just fulfilling a responsibility; you're also helping yourself. So, how do we pay better attention to the dog, Scott, um, or the cat? I think it partly, uh, if we're, I mean, I'm not talking about general care. I'm, again, I'm talking, you know, what you said that you know when we when an emergency situation comes up, uh, you're scattered, you're 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 not, uh, you know, you're di you're disoriented. Uh, you're not focusing and you may not think of a bunch of stuff that needs to be done to take care of those around you. And so uh, preparing ahead of time, you know, the, the definition of a disaster is an emergency situation you haven't prepared for. And so that is uh, applied to our pets. Now, the impetus for writing the book uh, is that uh, a lot of times people will be, uh, the other things that people are anxious to save, the other treasured items in their house that they're an anxious to save are things that they can't insure. Now, most of the time people don't insure their pets, but they can't and usually don't insure things like heirlooms or the family Bible or love letters or original old photographs or whatever these family history items are. All The items in the family that help to document the heritage and the legacy of the family, where they've come from, what they've been through. All of these things are so important. And these are treasured items that uh, once the, I, you know, in, in Santa Barbara, we had the painted cave fire. How long ago was that? I know some people that are still crying over photographs that they lost of their kids uh, from the painted cave fire. So uh, it's, it's heartbreak that doesn't really heal that well, especially when you get very, um, you know, when you start thinking about the past of your family and your family history, your animals are part of that treasured part of your personality that is, you know, they're part of the family. And so um, I, I have several, pay, uh, several items in the lab now, uh, valuable heirlooms. Uh, one is a, uh, a treasured uh, Buddha statue that were busted up and ripped because uh, they were put it, they, because they uh, came into contact with, uh, you know, a hundred pound dog or, uh, you know, or a crazy parrot that was scratching it up or I'm uh, going to LA tomorrow to look at a painting that's all busted up because of a cat. And uh, the- how did the, How did the cat get to the painting? 
uh, it, uh, the painting had, I had been taken off the wall. They were moving stuff. You know, it happens all the time. You take something off the wall to paint or rearrange things or, or to yeah. take it off to show it to somebody and then there's access to it. This was, I think this was actually hanging up by a shelf. You know how cats climb around the, cl climb around the house and uh, they, and the cat got to this. So the, the connection, the connection here is yes, uh, these are valued items for our, the, you know, for heart health, so to speak. And so I've tied in pets and your collectibles and heirlooms and, uh, you know, the artwork, a lot of the things that you can't insure and uh, that, uh, that you can't replace. You can't get another one. Uh, you can't get another, you can't get another bear. You can get another dog that is sweet and you love it, but it's not bear. And you can't replace the family Bible. You can't replace the old photographs. Uh, you, it, unless, you know, you've got on the cloud someplace and you've prepared for the disaster. Anyway, that was kind of the, that was kind of the impetus and, uh, and why I wrote the book. But there's also another end of it. Uh, if you want to hear about it, it doesn't yeah. have to do with pets. This is a great picture. This actually looks like my wife's last dog, Connor, who yeah. was a, a shepherd chow mix. And he is dialed in. Uh, this, the owner for this lives out uh, towards Riverside and for this dog. And uh, she's got everything she needs to safely transport this dog. They go. Yeah. Uh, oh she, yeah, they can be on the move immediately, and every yeah. got everything she needs to keep him safe. And uh, yeah. welcome back, it's Elizabeth Stewart. I'm talking with Scott Haskins, who's a disaster preparedness expert. This is his fourth book, forthcoming, due to be published this fall, and it is how to save your pet from a disaster. And we talked a little bit about, you know, the uh, our area, Santa Barbara. You know, we we often take off because there's a fire, there's mudslides, there's something happening, and we gotta leave town. And Scott was saying the importance of, um, you know, thinking ahead for our pets. You know, preparing a proper harness, a proper seat, having a grab and go kit for the dog with medications and food and this sort of thing. Yeah. So, so Scott, you, you were telling us the other side of the coin when we went to break. Well, about writing the book actually is, in, is right in line with the subject of your program because we're in this COVID-19 crisis and uh, we're all stuck at home. And, um, and so the idea of, you know, what can artists do? Uh, I'm not an artist, by the way. Uh, I have never painted a painting in my life my love of art and our skills and professional uh, treatment of artwork to preserve it and restore it doesn't have anything to do with creativity. I'm not an artist, but I have written books uh, in order to reach out to people and give them at home advice about protecting, preserving, uh, and maintaining their, their art and collectibles and heirlooms. But artists uh, have, uh, you know, ha your, your idea that artists can contribute to society and what do you do to help relieve the tension of the crisis? And uh, there's, there's so much can be done. My, uh, you know, my opinion is one that, uh, that maybe artists have uh, the ability uh, better than anybody to get involved, get involved heart and soul into a project and screen out the rest of the world screen out the problem just turn off uh you know social media and turn off the news and and dive into the my co-author on this book uh painted like a 180 foot fence with a mural on it out in the middle of some agricultural field up by i think san luis obispo or santa maria uh she just like uh, just uh, uh, you will not uh, hold her down creatively the, but the idea of, of getting involved create, creatively is, uh, is something that can not only save your own soul and uh, your own state. You know, the question here is emotional resilience. That's, that's kind of, in my, I've kind of boiled it all down to emotional resilience. And if your emotional resilience is solid, you're going to be of help to people all around you. And you're going to be of help also to your community. In this case, uh, I connected with a guy that uh, helped me to uh, bang out this book and pull, pull all of my resources and put it together. And uh, it's, been, it's been a fantastic, and if anybody wants to 
uh, you know, wants to email me or call me, uh, my email address is F A C L A R T D O C at gmail.com. F A C L art doc at gmail.com. And write me, and I'll be happy to, you know, give you the name of this fellow that helped me get this book out of the way. And then the other thing I did was I uh, signed up to kind of get more up to date about uh, marketing my uh, services and my book on the internet. Social media algorithms are changing all the time. Uh, what you thought was good five years ago uh, now is not the same game. And so, um, and I've got, you know, I've got another person that I'm working with on that to up my game with that. If somebody's interested in know, knowing more about these guys, I've done a lot of research to, to, to connect with the very best and I'm happy to pass along uh, their names. But the idea here is one of emotional resilience and, uh, and that is a part of taking care of your pet. It's also part of taking care of these treasured, treasured things that belong to your family's heritage and your collectibles and uh, has to do with uh, being stable for other people around you. I'm going through old photos right now and I'm scanning them to, you know, to the computer and I'm actually in a space in my mind where I'm um, actually retitling them. And so, you know, it's like, well, I, I, I'm kind of like thinking, well, in these days when, you know, dear friends may not be here too long because of the illness, and even family members, you know, my mom and dad both tested positive for this disease, you know, they're in their 90s. So I'm thinking, let me, you know, make a record of the family treasure. So I've been, you know, yeah. taking post-it notes and saying, well, this is when dad did this and mom did this and where we were and this sort of thing, where it didn't really matter in the past. But now That's it seems smart. that it's become, yeah, it's become... More central, I think for a lot of my clients, I've been getting questions like, if you had a, a free couple of days, let's say, and work was kind of not real urgent, you know, what would, how, how would you best think about, let's take the family photos since we're talking about that. I want to know your prescription for what you would do if you had a box full of family photos, Scott, and I'm sure we all do, cardboard box somewhere what you would do to kind of get a handle on those photos. It's a little bit of deviation from our topic, but Richard, we, do we have to go to quick break one more time? Let's go to quick break. When we get back from the break, I once got to address what I've been hearing from a lot of my clients is, you know, I've got some treasured things, family photos and old books and scrapbooks and uh, paper, em ephemera. You know, what, what shall I best do with my time now that I've got that time? Don't turn that down. Back with Scott. Exactly what you need. Good. To Okay, good. Don't turn that down back with Scott Haskins. So I'm here with Scott Haskins, who's a disaster preparedness expert in regards to your stuff. And my question to him was, let's say we've got a few hours and we want to do something with our family photos. What would you, what oh, should you we do? You say a few hours, you said a couple of days. Couple of days, okay. <laughs> okay don't cut me short. All right, okay. first of all, first of all, you've got a couple of days, you've got 90, you've got 90 year old parents, get an oral history get them recorded get their voices recorded get some information that may give you context for some of the photographs that you've got in your pile number two is while they're still around label all the photographs that you can write on the back of them with a pencil and or if they're digital photographs change the name of the digit of the of the file but get them labeled who's in the photograph when was it taken your best guess and uh, you know because you can get the information with from your sister that lives in Denver and you can talk to your parents and those are the first two then if you've got if you've got any more time in the in your two-day limit um, there are page protectors that you can buy from Staples or someplace that are going to fit your old original photos or whatever photo and just put just throw them into those page protectors that's the cheapest way to put together an archival scrapbook Put together, I'll throw them into those page protectors and put them in a notebook, and that's it, right? That's all the time I got. No, yeah, well, basically, what you said is, I think that oral history thing is something that's really important, and I really don't, important. I never thought of that. Yeah, really. I think that that's that's fantastic. And there are books so, that will help you figure out all the questions that you have to ask. So before we have to go real fast, how do people find you, Scott? Uh, they can email me f a c l art doc 
at Gmail. My phone number, uh, my mobile phone number is 805-570-4140. And call and we'll chat. Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. And the book is, the You're new the book coming, book. How, how to Save Your Pet in a Disaster, that's coming. But more importantly, this is the fourth book in a series about saving your stuff. Thank you, Scott. You guys are great. Thanks for the invite. Bye.